Well, hello, hockey fans. Good evening. Welcome back to the Hockey Writers Live. Somehow it is episode number 11, December the 9th, 2020. I am your host, Mark Scheig. And God, we might be about a month away from hockey, believe it or not, with everything that's been going on. So we really do appreciate you jumping on board with us tonight here. Have a wonderful show planned for you here for the next hour. Around 8.30, we're going to have our New York Rangers panel come on board. We're going to talk Lafreniere. We're going to talk Capo Caco. We're going to talk David Quinn. We're going to talk about everything about the Rangers. But right now, we are honored to be joined by Courtney Laughlin, who covers the Washington Capitals Courtney, welcome to the Hockey Writers Live. Thank you guys so much for having me. This is so exciting when you're just talking about talking about Rangers and everybody like hockey could be starting soon. This is awesome. I feel like this is the best way I'd want to spend a Wednesday night is literally talking about hockey for real. We and we couldn't agree <laughs> more. And that's we do this every Wednesday. Just we need some normalcy in our lives. And I figured what better way to do it than to talk about just hockey. I'm with you. Yeah. Where are we starting? Well, just how are you doing in all this? Good. Um, it's obviously been a long couple months um, mm -hmm. without hockey. And obviously with the announcement that hopefully everything's going to start on January 13th. Um, so normalcy back into our lives. So yeah. this background set behind me is what I decided to do at my parents' house. So I have an apartment in D.C., yep. but my a very small apartment, um, <laughs> 500 square foot apartment in D.C. So wow. I decided to come to my dad's house and... All this cap stuff, make this set for all these Zoom calls that we do. Um, so that was kind of part of my job the last couple months was trying to locate all of this hockey and cap stuff that he had lying around the house and put it to good use. And look at that. That is an epic setup. I mean, I, <laughs> I'm i jealous. I don't know about anybody else, but I wish I, I could set up like that. I mean, it's just like, it's just a bunch of stuff. And the crazy thing is, is that we still have more of it around this house. <laughs> Um, <laughs> and actually I had to thin out the shelves because at one point my mom came down here and she was like, that just looks too cluttered. And I was like, okay, so there's like caps hats sitting over here on the mantle. There's, there's yep. literally, it's just, it's just caps everywhere. So, right. We're, we're finally talking about hockey, but now, you know, we had the pandemic. What, what were you able to do or what kinds of activities did you get yourself into to try to pass the time? So us Lachlans are very competitive. Surprise, surprise. Um, I guess I get Locker. that from my father. <laughs> um, I picked up tennis, believe it or not. And oh. I literally played, I would say minimum five times a week with my dad. Um, wow. we would go out there in the, even uh, we live in right outside of DC and the heat a mm -hmm. hundred degrees with humidity. Um, and we would literally just go out there and play tennis for hours because it was outside it was yep. socially distanced it was safe um i'm i'm in my 30s so i consider myself a woman sometimes i will say this though that my dad did make me cry a couple times playing tennis because he just wouldn't go easy on me he's like toughen up court what are you doing <laughs> i'd be like i thought this was supposed to be a friendly game he's like no he's like you're gonna quit on me <laughs> oh my god that craig in a nutshell how about that so that's how I spent my summer was, um, I thought I was done with sports, but I guess yep. not. <laughs> so did, were you able to win at all? Uh, no. no. And then, and then you add my brother into the mix and it was oh, just boy. a disaster. That's a, but you did get better though. That's the goal, right? <laughs> I did. I took lessons several times a week too. Cause like my goal was just to be able to play my dad. Um, I'm still not quite there yet because it's, it's mm -hmm. difficult trying to get the serve down and the it's, it, it's, it's a lot. <laughs> Um, but I will say that it helped keep me sane during, and my dad, um, during mm. the last couple months, really. Absolutely. So my, my quick story about how I passed time with the pandemic, we were really lucky, you know, the Nintendo switch is one of the hardest things to find out there. Yes, we, it were is. we were able to get one because Walmart happened to have one on the shelf at the exact time we were searching on the internet. And so we were able to bring it home and I had never been into like Mario Deluxe or anything like that, even though the game came out like six or seven years ago. So you got frustrated playing tennis. <laughs> I broke controllers playing Mario. Let me tell you, I've already been through one controller and I've had my family just witness just the rage of continuous deaths with Mario. It is, but you know what? It, it at least it passed the time and it was just, it was something to do to kind of keep my mind off of what was going on in the world. So were you successful in the video games? Because I know those things are time consuming, right? And trying to beat them 
and beating I, the video games. It's a lot of work. It is. And a lot of frustrate, a lot of hours, a lot of frustration, but ultimately I was able to beat the game after, after like almost a month, but it finally got there. So yes. That's impressive yeah. actually. Well, Which, thank that's you. That's awesome. I can't, I, I've tried so many times to play video games yep. and I just can't, I don't have, I don't know. I don't have the dexterity in my, I, I don't oh. know. I, I want to, cause I think they're so cool. I just mm-hmm. can't. It's the first time in like five or six years that I picked up a, a video game controller. So it took a lot of adjustment again. Like yeah, thinking back to when you were a kid, like I did this all the time, but now when growing up and stuff like that, you just don't anymore. It's just like almost a foreign concept. Yeah, totally. So so Courtney, we're all the talk now about a possible January 13th start. Should we be optimistic <laughs> about all these reports that are coming down? I think so. Look, I, I feel like when everybody, when everything was happening with the NHL and the Players Association and NHLPA and trying to figure out the financials, that was the hardest, the biggest hurdle, right? Was they had this plan for the return to play plan and then everything kind of hit the fan when the teams now were maybe expecting to have some fans come this new season and they weren't. So I'm very optimistic. I'm planning. I'm like January 13th. It's go time. We're dropping the puck. um, Whether it's the caps on that night or the 14th or the 15th. I just think that all these sports teams don't want to miss a season, right? We even saw baseball. As soon as the the NHL came out with their return to play plan plan in July, baseball's like, Oh, cause everybody was saying that baseball was going to lock out. Right. And that they weren't going to play. And then baseball's like, no, we want to play. Um, so I think they have everything in order. I think the players want to play. Um, it, I, I'm ready. I'm going, I'm preparing now. This is my first little tune up to get ready to get my button gear for caps hockey. So I'm ready. I think it's going to happen. And I think we're going to have a season, a shortened one at whatever they're saying, 56 games. 56. Yeah. In fact, yeah. I actually talked to Nick Felino a little bit earlier today, working on a story and he's they're, they're chomping at the bit. They're ready to go. Yeah. And he even admitted just the things that he's hearing. He said that things are always fluid and things can change, but they're expecting a late December, early January, you know, kind of a training camp to get ready for that possible day. And it's just how exciting is that? You know, I never thought that they would actually get here the way things were going, but now that optimism, like it's really starting to hit. Fine. It is. And and I don't know, and I'm sure players in Columbus have been doing the same too, but you know, nope. a lot of the Caps players have been here. Tom Wilson drove across the border a couple of weeks ago. Lundquist has been skating at practice. Um, mm-hmm. So a lot of the players have, have been getting back out there. Um, yep. And so I think that those are all good, positive signs that, we are going to have a season. Exactly. And Felino admitted that they have the Blue Jackets are already back in Columbus yep. and they're just waiting for some of the European players to kind of start trickling in, but they've been working out every day, like three to four times a week. And they're, they say they're ready. So, that, you know, good on them to uh, have a plan to be ready, no matter you know what comes from this. So they knew that this time was going to come. Yeah. I think the biggest thing is the schedule right what is that going to look like with trying to get 56 games in before july 7th or whatever their date is before the olympics start it's Mm going to be grueling right it's going to be three and four nights and back to backs and and a a different type of season than any other season we've seen but we're seeing that with all sports right we're seeing that with football's on every night when was the last time football was on every night oh my gosh right that's Unbelievable. How, how about them Reds, uh, Redskins? Good Lord. I, I still call them that team. all the time. <laughs> but to go into Pittsburgh like that on a Monday night and knock off the undefeated Steelers, that, that's got to be good for, for the Washington fans, right? Totally. They're loving it. Um, Absolutely. Yeah, it's great. Good stuff. So here's a question for you that I think a lot of people are going to be interested in because I think it's going to be geography related, but fans are we going to see any fans anywhere? I, I don't see it at the beginning. Do you see something different there? No, I don't see any fans in the beginning. Um, and in fact, I saw that Washington Capitals did email their season ticket holders and said there won't be fans, at least in the beginning, but we're hopeful. We'll kind of we'll kind of mm-hmm. let you know yeah. how it goes on. And it's tricky, right? And hockey is one of those sports where it's inside and it's not outside like football and it's a smaller stadium. Yep. I want to be, I'm unfortunately not as positive about the fan aspect as I am about the season starting on January 13th. I wish I was. 
Um, I don't, maybe playoffs, maybe at the end of the season, maybe they'll do another bubble and they'll be, they'll be able to bring fans into a bubble city if they do that for the playoffs. But Mm -hmm. I feel like maybe I'm holding out for 2021, 2022 to go to a game, unfortunately. Yeah. It seems like that that's the reality with vaccines, the way cases are going here in Pennsylvania, our governor just tested positive for the coronavirus. And there's now talk about even more restrictions coming back do the simple things like indoor dining, yeah. they're going to a gym or anything. They might be shutting it down again for a few weeks just to get things under control. So if that's happening, yeah. I don't possibly see any way that there could be fans, especially at the beginning. Maybe a phased in approach, but kind of, you have to go week by week at this point. I don't see Maybe. any other way. And I also think like, it's also going to be interesting this time around too, because the teams aren't in a bubble, right? So the players are going to be traveling and what does that look like? And Mm -hmm. how do they keep the players safe and the people that are driving them on the bus, bringing them to the rink. So I I think there's so many moving parts with all of our lives, whether it's how we're watching sports or just in general, everything is so fluid and changes literally daily. Yep, and just stay tuned to all your sources out there because things are going to constantly change. And you know what we're talking about now could be old news in five minutes, the way things are pacing. So right. see where it goes. So let's now switch and talk to about your expertise, the Washington Capitals. Well, you have right. a new coach this year. And the last time we checked in with the Capitals, they were knocked out of the playoffs. So I ask you, they brought Peter LaViolette in. What is he going to be able to bring to the Capitals that maybe they didn't have before? What can help them get back over the hump to chasing a championship? Well, one of the things that general manager, general manager Brian McClellan said was that he wanted to change the culture, right? And he he wanted mm-hmm. to get back to the winning caps. That their first round exit versus the Islanders was brutal, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, that wasn't the caps. They didn't have that spark. And I think what Laviolette brings, number one, It's a different voice. If you think about who the Caps had as a coach, they had Barry Trotz and then they had Weirden. To me, that's kind of the same voice, right? Because as an assistant, you're just reiterating what your head coach is saying. So that's been kind of the same voice, same coaching philosophy that the Caps have had for six years. And as a player, you get you it kind of goes in and out at a certain point, right? And you're maybe you're just not getting the message across. I think Laviolette is going to be a tougher coach um, than Reardon. And Mm -hmm. remember too, as an assistant, Reardon was an assistant under Trotz and then he gets named head coach. As an assistant, your job is more of a liaison between the players, right? And I always think of this from the movie Miracle, right? And I remember Herb Brooks said, it's not my job, it's your job to be their friend. He's like, I'm not their friend, I'm the coach. And I still think that the, the assistant coaches still have a little bit of that responsibility where they are getting more of the pulse of the team and they're not they're, they're, they're not the head boss, right? So right. I, I think that that was a, a little bit of a problem that, not a problem, but a challenge that Todd Reardon had when he came in and also <laughs> coaching a Stanley Cup team, right? A team mm-hmm. that won the cup but not necessarily under his philosophies, under somebody else's, under Barry Trotz. So I'm excited for this coaching change because I I think that the Caps, they have so much talent that Mm -hmm. they need somebody that's going to come and push the right buttons, right? We need to see the 2018 Kuznetsov. Where has he been, right? No, pretty up and down, right? Uh, Inconsistent and Verona non-existent in the playoffs. So I think, I think it's a different message it's a, I'm hoping it's going to be a little bit more sterner, stronger, but at the end of the day, I think his coaching philosophy fits well with the way that the caps lineup is built. Mm. Um, He's going to encourage a lot of offense, but that stems from good defense. Absolutely. Courtney Laughlin joining us on the hockey writers live. It's about quarter after eight. Remember to hit that subscribe button and hit like on Facebook. So you don't miss these interviews moving forward. So Courtney, you brought Lundquist up earlier. He said he's already even kind of started working out and stuff and is in town. Is he the opening night starter? And then how do you actually see the split between him and Ilya Samsonov go? Gosh, you're hitting me with all the tough questions. <laughs> <laughs> oh, this one's tough for me because mm-hmm. I think it's Samson- Samsonov's net, to be honest, to start. Um, okay. They bring in Lundquist. He's a culture guy, right? I mentioned Laviolette wants to change the culture. He's a locker room guy. He has a presence. No doubt that Lundquist 
wanted to come to DC to win a cup to continue his year here. Um, I also think that, you know, I mentioned the schedule, possibly three and four nights. How are they going to play? So I think there's going to be a lot of back to backs going on Mm -hmm. with every team in the National Hockey League. So uh, not quite 50 50, but I think Lundqvist is going to get some good net time. But I still think that they're going to want to put Samsonov in um, to see how he does and to give him a little more more confidence, obviously coming off an injury. Um, That's a tough one. I, I, they got two really great options though. Right. And I think that that he's a, go, he's a great mentor for Samsonov to yep. develop and to groom him into the Caps starting goaltender. And it, the confidence is there within the organization on Samsonov, right? They, they yep. feel like that he can be the number one and maybe this will be a season of one whisk can really show him the ropes on stuff to where eventually he'll be the true number one. And, you know, however long it might be. Totally. And, and Lundqvist is just, I mean, I've heard so many great things about him, about how he is in the locker room and in the community. I'm seeing all these things on Twitter about his charity and yep. he was in DC taking pictures with his kids walking around Georgetown. Um, wow. So uh, yeah, I think he's going to be a great mentor, but I think they have such a great option in him if something were to happen to Samsonov, but I, I'm saying that it's, they're going to put Sam. I guess if I had to pick one mm-hmm. there, it's going to be Samsonov on opening night on January 13th, on January 13th. <laughs> there's, there it is. Now, the thing that I'll say about Lundqvist too, there, there's going to be a motivation to win him a Stanley cup. Yeah. Too. And I can't wait to see how the team reacts, you know, to him just being there, do it for Henrik. If it gets to that point, you know, he only might have a couple chances left at this. So totally. I, this might be his last chance. Who knows? Um, exactly. With his age and everything, 500, whatever wins that he has yeah. or 400 and whatever. <laughs> um, totally. I, I agree with you on that. That'll, that'll be really weird. To, the first Ranger capital game to see Lundquist in that net. That will be really weird. I think it's even just going to be weird. Really seeing him in a caps Jersey. Exactly. And Couldn't put it any better. Yeah, it's going to be strange. So, court. So, top six seems pretty set. Your usual suspects are going to mostly be there. The thing that I want to know from you, there, there's some guys down the bottom six that might be ready to kind of take the next step or might make an impact on the team. Is there one or two guys that you see taking that important next step? So, this is interesting to me because there were a couple areas where the Caps, in my mind, really struggled last year. Mm-hmm. Um, bottom six is one of them power play and they had a couple issues on their back end with their defense i'm interested to see on the third line it's probably going to be eller and haglin Mm -hmm. daniel sprong i'm slotting daniel sprong in as the third line what right winger 23 this kid played in pittsburgh and anaheim i believe um correct he was a black ace for them when they played in the bubble young guy and here's the thing the caps are trying to get younger right i mean they Mm -hmm. were one of the older teams in the bubble they have 11 guys that are 30 or older and it's the young man's game right so now you bring in a guy like daniel sprong and that secondary scoring was something that we did not see from the caps last season and i think one of the biggest holes was after brett Connolly left and he was one of the superstars when the caps won the cup 20 22 goals he scored that year or over 20 Mm -hmm. 20 goal score I don't think the Caps had that last year. So I yeah. think that third line right winger is going to go to Daniel Sprong. And for me, he's the player that I really want to see how he slots in there. The fourth line, Ponick, Dowd, Hathaway. I think that for me, that's what I think the fourth line is going to be. Okay. Um, but so that secondary scoring on that mm-hmm. third line, I think is going to be really important. Absolutely. Now, speak. You mentioned the Pittsburgh connection. You know, Brooks <laughs> Orpik used to be a Penguin, went to the Capitals at one point. This year, it's Justin Schultz. And I just yeah. wonder, he seems going to fit in the top four there. What are the Capitals hoping that he'll be able to bring to them? I think, and they had Orpik and Niskanen, right? That's when both right. of those guys came over. Um, I think, when, and when you look at the Caps and the Penguins, they play a very similar style. They're built the same way. You've got Ovechkin and Crosby. You've got Malkin and Kuznetsov or Backstrom. You've got Latang and Carlson. They're yeah. so similar and they play such a similar style in terms of transitioning from defense 
to offense. And so one of the big things that the Caps have always wanted to do, they brought in Nick Jensen to do this, is a first pass type of player, right? Making Mm -hmm. sure that the way that the Caps are breaking out, you don't see them just throwing the puck away on the boards and trying to rim it around and getting the puck out and throwing pizzas up the middle. They're trying to make that first pass, the Carlson to a who's Kuznetsov so the D to the center so I think Schultz is going to do that same thing and I think he's used to that system in Pittsburgh where they have the same philosophy Latang gives it to Crosby so I I think he's a great fit and that was another area that the Caps really needed to try to bolster up especially with Kempney out with another injury which is a terrible terrible loss and not just one brutal injury but two brutal injuries that are kind of unheard of Yep. Um, so I think he's going to be a great fit. Yeah, and they, they needed to pull somebody in like that. That's a pretty good top four. Carlson's still going to do his thing. Brendan Dillon, you guys acquired last year, is going to fit in nicely. And I think a guy that doesn't get enough attention is Dmitry Orlov. I think he's mm-hmm. really, really just a good, solid defenseman. I think that's a pretty good top four going on there. Yeah, and then you've got Siegenthaler and Jensen, and then they got JVR. And I, I think they have a lot of good – Options, Faravari. I mean, they yep. have some good options of guys that they can rotate in there. But I think getting that a, a top four D, especially with Campania, was really important. A yep. couple more questions for you here. I think these are going to be a couple of the tougher ones that we're going to throw by you. Because um, <laughs> I think the hockey world is going to be watching this, kind of a developing story with age and some of the rumors that are out there. But how, long, how much longer does Alexander Ovechkin wear a <sighs> Capitals uniform? Oh, my heart will break. Um, <laughs> yeah, I <so> many others. <laughs> I know it, he's going to end when Backstrom ends. Uh, they're going to yeah. end together five years. Um, okay. I think he's going to take a five-year deal. Might be a little bit lower than he wanted, especially given the flat salary cap and everything that's happening financially with these teams. Yep. Um, five years is is my prediction, and then he's going to go and go play for what Dynamo in Moscow Dynamo, and go home and. And end his career there. Um, wow. So enjoy the next five years. <laughs> yeah, and it, it would, I wouldn't put it past him to still can still score at a forty goal pace. He's just you, the envy of the hockey world to have a player like that to be the captain, to be the all world player that he is. Just fascinating, and then to finally see him win a cup the way he did. Yeah, just what a career. The Caps fans have had it really, really good. Just. I think I wrote a piece not that long ago, just five straight Metro division titles for the Cowboys, just, just dominance under him. And, and it's interesting that you you brought that up too. I I heard my dad doing an interview on, I I think it must've been XM earlier today. He's like, Ovechkin's going to score 44 goals this season. I'm like, wow, he's already predicting the 44 (laughs) goals. And then I heard him say, obviously I didn't hear the other end, but he's like, yeah, he's like, of course Ovechkin's going to score that many goals, but it's what Ovechkin does. Right. And and he's been able to evolve with, I guess the times of the game and also Mm -hmm. his body slowing down a little bit, which was, which is what makes him great. I I do think it's unfortunate with the shortened seasons. Now I, I yeah. don't think he's going to catch Gretzky. I mean, with Ugh. 56 games I and the little shortened season last year, I don't know. He'd have to pull out a miracle, but I guess if anyone can do it, he can. Leave it up to him. I know. With everybody, kind of, you know, you mentioned like the 11 players that are 30 years and older. Yeah. The window has been open for several years in Washington. Do we start to see a point where that window is starting to close a little bit now with the eight, with players getting older, some younger players coming in, just how much longer is this current window open in your mind, Courtney? I would say maybe give it two years. I think this season and maybe another one. I mean, by the time you're looking at Alex Ovechkin's third, fourth, and fifth year on that contract, I'm saying he's going to get, Mm -hmm. (laughs) um, I I just think, look, the, the caps sold away the future for the present, right? When they were trying to go for it to win the cup. So they sold a lot of their assets. They have one of the weakest farm teams in the NHL right now. Not a lot of prospects, not a lot of draft picks. So I'm giving, like, if they're going to do it again, I would say it's going to have to be within the next two, maybe three years. I know that's kind of depressing. But But given the recent success that the team has had, you know, 
look what happened the last time. I mean, the, the, with the draft, you guys drafted Ovechkin, and then from yeah. there, everything just took off. So it's cyclical in nature. Sad to see it end, but there could, there can always be a new beginning. So there's always reason for hope. And I know a, the, a guy that I've actually followed in the OHL that I'm really excited to see what he does is Connor McMichael. I cannot wait to see. That's the one prospect that I think can really stick in the NHL because the, the kid can play. Oh, he can play. He's just so exciting to watch. I sit and I watch like his highlights and stuff. And I'm like, this kid's incredible. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I, what, he was a black ace, I think too, for the bubble. Mm-hmm. So I don't know what, I mean, obviously extended roster sizes I heard they're talking about. Yeah. So we'll see if he cracks the lineup at some point. Yeah, so let me throw, because the talk of the division now, the division lineup, it seems like that most of the Metro is going to stay mm-hmm. and that, with the Capitals in it add Buffalo and Boston. How do you see the capital stacking up in that division? If that's the way that it falls in another hard question. <laughs> <laughs> so we do here hard questions. I think Let it's tough. It's yeah. tough. I, I think all the teams in the Metro are tough flyers, tough yep. matchup Rangers, tough matchup Buffalo. I, it's going to be a dog fight to be honest. And yep. maybe I'd want to be Columbus right now. I don't know. <laughs> Got Tampa Bay though. Tampa Bay, Carolina, true. they got their own problem. Everyone's got their own issues. That is true. That's, that's what's going to make this a fascinating season. I mean, we had it in 12 and 13 with that 48 game season. Yeah. And if you get off to like a say no and five, oh, and six start, you could already be behind the eight ball. You have to start fast if you want to get somewhere. Yeah. You, you don't want to get behind. Right. And I, I think so many times too, like we all sit here and we're like, Oh, and the, in January or February after the all-star break, we're like, okay, the team is just playing uninspired because it's the winter doldrums and all of the things, all the things that are happening. Um, So with the 56 game season, like there, there's no days off for any team. Yep. That's everyone's got to start quick or else you'll be behind Mm -hmm. very quickly. So let's end on a very high note. You guys have a wonderful foundation. So I just wanted to kind of give you guys a chance to talk it up. What is the Laughlin Family Foundation? I know it's something that is very near and dear to your heart. So just tell the fans what that is about and possibly how they can help. Sure. Um, so actually, I have a funny story for you about Absolutely. this. Absolutely. Um, and, it, and it involves Columbus and John Tortorella. So I never get to talk about John Tortorella. And I got to be honest, I'm like, okay. I secretly like, think he's incredible as a coach like he's just he's he's fiery he's passionate like I would run through a brick wall for that man um (laughs) so this is so I guess in what was it 2018 actually the year that the Caps were doing their Stanley Cup run my mom was diagnosed with a rare form of cancer and Mm. we kind of kept the diagnosis secret because she didn't want to go public with it and it being with who my dad is and all these things so we really didn't share any of the news with anybody mm-hmm. until that following hockey season when the Washington Capitals approached my dad and they said, hey, for our Hockey Fights Cancer Night, obviously a wonderful initiative that the NHL puts together with every team. Every team has their own Hockey Fights Cancer Night to raise money um, for the NHL's initiatives. They asked if my mom would do the ceremonial puck drop. Mm. And at, kind of at that same time, obviously she had dealt with her own issues with cancer and being, and having such a rare cancer that she didn't have access to the knowledge, the treatments, the doctors um, that a lot of these other well-known cancers have and the, Mm -hmm. and the treatments and no, nobody knows about these rare cancers. So they don't have the same access to kind of all those things in the medical field. So kind of simultaneously as The caps were asking if my mom would be interested in dropping the puck, which was like totally not her thing, right? Like she's always been behind. Like my dad's been out in the spotlight. I'm out in the spotlight. She's been the one that's been taking care of everybody from behind the scenes. Yes. And so it kind of happened where we thought, hey, if we can try to make a difference and use the, not necessarily use the Cocky Fights Cancer Night, but use it as an avenue and an outlet to raise awareness for her cancer, which then can help help other patients like her 
then she was like, yes, I'll do it. So that is how, that's the story of how we started our foundation was eventually my mom's willingness to go public with her diagnosis with hockey fights, cancer night. Now, Mm. two things. One, she has never dropped a puck in her entire life. So my dad and I were teaching her how to drop a puck at a face off. Um, And then two, the story comes full circle with the Columbus coach, John Tortorella. Okay. Because that night and my, and the whole time, mind you, my mom had just gone through surgery, six rounds of chemo. And this was like literally two weeks after her last round of chemo, Mm -hmm. not feeling great. And she had lost um, some feeling in her legs with neuropathy from the treatment. So Mm -hmm. she was so worried that she was going to fall. And my dad said, don't worry, we're not going to, you're not going to fall. Um, everything's going to be fine. They have carpet down. It's secured. It's going to be fine. So the lights mm. go dark. Everybody's getting ready. My mom's about to walk onto the ice and the, there was a cord and she actually hit the cord, hit the rug and fell. And oh, she wow. brings my dad down with her right as soon as the lights are about to go on. They quickly get up. She walks out She and, and, and nobody really, I think. Tarek from The Athletic knows this story because we told him, but we haven't really shared this story much. Oh, okay. She, she gets up, she walks out, she drops the puck. Immediately, obviously, that's nerve wracking, right? You just fall or 20,000 people watching you. She walks back and immediately come running over to her is John Tortorella. And he says, Craig, I had no idea that this was your wife. If there's anything I can do, please let me know. Um, Do you need my training staff to look out for her? Or is she okay? Are you okay? Is my dad okay? Um, And immediately after the game, he texted my dad and just said, Hey, Locker, I just want to make sure that everything's okay. If you need anything, I'm here and I'm I'm rooting for you and your mom. So that on top of John Tortorella skipping a game because of his family dog passing away Mm -hmm. um, were the two things that just solidified him as a, as a human being um, and and just how, uh, how great of a guy he really is. So that's kind of the long story of the Lachlan family foundation. Um, It is tough right now with nonprofits and charities, especially with everything going on, but we're still there and we're still trying to make a difference and help those diagnosed with rare cancer. Listen, what a story. I, that's just, it, it fits John Tortorella to a team. It does. A, it a does. lot of fans see the fiery side on the camera. What they don't know is just how much of a human being he really is. He's just mm-hmm. one of the most incredible people out there. And I, I wish more people knew that, but hearing a story like that really solidifies it. And, totally. and you can go to the Laughlin family foundation.org. You can get a lot more information out there. I'm actually going to buy a couple of the masks that you are advertising. And so I'll be in contact with you to get that arranged as we want to, you know, kind of, you know, say, listen, you know, everyone needs a little bit of a helping hand. This is close to me too. You know, my mother, my grandmother all died during the holidays due to different cancers. So anything that we can do to find a cure for this thing once and for all, you know, we're, we're going to support it. So I will definitely be in contact with you and fans do the same thing. If I know they're out on Twitter as well, mm-hmm. um, you just, you can DM them and, you know, I think it's like $25 for a mask or two for 40 or something like that, but yeah, well worth it because it's going to a very good cause. So Courtney, thank you so, so, so much for joining us here on the hockey writers live. It was a lot of fun t- catching up with you and an upcoming season. How exciting. <laughs> You got me all fired up. I'm like, okay, what game am I going to go watch right now? Like, I'm like, (laughs) I'm like all fired up talking hockey. This was great. Oh, no. Thank you so much. And fans, you can follow her on Twitter if you don't. It's at Courtney L underscore caps. Follow her. She does a wonderful job. Thanks for your time tonight, Courtney. We'll see you down the road. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Yep. No problem. Courtney Laughlin joining us here on the Hockey Writers Live.